Good afternoon uh, to all of you. Uh, a warm welcome uh, to this webinar on behalf of uh, Francesco Pignatelli, uh, Elisa Action Leader, on behalf of uh, Lorena Hernandez, uh, uh, Policy Officer at the European Commission's Joint Research Center. And of course, on my behalf, uh, Simon Vrechar, uh, external consultant, also working at the European Commission's uh, uh, Joint Research Center. So today's topic of the webinar is improving knowledge transfer across organizations by knowledge graphs, uh, with the emphasis on application and experimentation within the ELISA action. So to uh, know a bit about the ELISA action, I suggest to spend a few uh, slides and words on that. So what is ELISA? ELISA action uh, stands for European Location Interoperability Solution of e-government and is, or it was, because ISA Square program is, was coming to an end last year, one of the 50 actions uh, uh, covering, uh, uh, dealing with the location perspective in the, so, uh, in the European Inter Interoperability Program, ISA Square. So what was it for? Was support to digital government transformation, or better to say location able, enabled digi digital government transformation and the best use of location data and technologies in an inter interoperable manner. It was intended to uh, citizens, businesses, and public administrations. As we can see uh, on the next slide, uh, there were, let's say, four ma main objectives of ELISA action. One of those was uh, supporting uh, different policy initiatives at the European and national level, then providing reusable, interoperable, cross-border and cross-sector frameworks and solutions uh, for public administrations, businesses and citizens. Uh, discovering how emerging trends and technologies enable more effective use of location data for policy and digital public services. And last but not least, building a knowledge base to inform and train stakeholders and promote the adoption of good practices and innovations in location data. So all these objectives uh, were somehow, uh, let's say, covered with four main pillars through studies, applications, frameworks and solutions, and geo-knowledge based service uh, uh, implemented through, let's say, covering different topics, which you can see on the right side of the slide, and in which I won't go into the details. So geo-knowledge based service was also one of the important uh, pillar of uh, an objective of ELISE, and also today's webinar is actually part of uh, this kind of uh, spatial skills and informing stakeholders about our work. As you can see on the next slide, today we have uh, four prominent speakers with us that will present uh, the work. So there are Danny van der Brucke and Mark uh, Oleislegers from uh, KU Leuven. And then we have two guest speakers, Oscar Corcho, a professor from uh, Politecnico Madrid, and Andres Kupin from, uh, Skupin from uh, uh, Big Knowledge. A part of uh, our speakers, we invited also for uh, prominent guests, so-called dis discussants, that will, in the uh, discussion part, share their opinion, and comments, and takeaways. Uh, just to mention, uh, so uh, in this part, they will be joining Seth van Hulen from European Commission's uh, DigiDigit, Rob Lemons from University Twente in Enschede, Netherlands, Aniko Grencher, uh, Grencher uh, from Publications Office in, of the European Union, and Sven Schade from European Commission's Joint Research Center. So at this point, I would invite Danny to start guiding you into the uh, knowledge graphs and the ELISA universe and the content of the webinar. Enjoy the webinar. Please, Danny. Uh, thanks, uh, Simon, for this introduction. <clears throat> so I will guide you through this uh, webinar and hand over to my colleagues at different points in time. Um, so the focus today is on uh, uh, knowledge transfer, as we call it, across organizations. And we looked into uh, the use of knowledge graphs, but not only uh, to do so. Uh, so what is what do we try to cover, more or less, uh, is we first introduce a few concepts, also a little bit of the background, a few definitions. Then we will look at what knowledge graphs are and how they can be used, mainly with an example of the city of Zaragoza and the use of it at municipal level. Uh, then uh, Kay Leuven did some work on the development for release on glossaries, but also tried to link to other glossaries, vocabularies, and ontologies. 
uh, we did some experimentation with knowledge graphs to build and to represent the Elise action or the Elise uh, world. Uh, and then uh, we will go to uh, some conclusions, but uh, very briefly, because we want then to hand over to uh, more advanced experiences uh, using also machine learning and other techniques to uh, manage knowledge and to manage knowledge transfer. And then uh, it's not the traditional Q&A at the end, but rather a panel discussion. So as it has been said, a few people were invited to follow the webinar and then to provide their comments, their feedback, takeaways. So that's uh, what you will do. What are the key messages uh, up front uh, to be given? Uh, first of all, Elise, some of you know already, others are maybe new for Elise. I won't explain more in detail than has been done by Simon, but uh, it's a universe, uh, it's let's say geospatial related to e-government and digital transformation of government. And in reality, it contains a rich portfolio of resources. Uh, there are studies made, webinars, e-learning material. Uh, there is also news. There is uh, a lot of things out there. And that we call the Elise universe. Um, this universe and the resources should be managed and transferred. So knowledge transfer should happen. And the experience in LE should be transferred. And we think that semantic assets and knowledge graphs can be a help there, a tool to do that in a better way. And then finally, we think that the future is bright between brackets so that uh, there is a lot more possible which we did not do in Elise action, but also not in this particular study or will not be revealed totally in this webinar, but uh, the semantic web, other techniques like machine learning and national language processing are promising in order to manage knowledge, but also to transfer knowledge in the future. Uh, what is the objectives of this particular work uh, as part of the ELISA action and the ELISA knowledge graphs was to investigate and experiment with knowledge graphs and knowledge graphs methodologies and techniques to get results and formulate recommendations so that it can be also used by other organizations, not only GRC, but uh, in the whole community. Uh, second objective is to perform a uh, more a more consolidated exercise uh, at the moment that Elise is closing down. It has been said, as a square uh, program is stopping, Elise action is stopping, but there will be follow-ups and especially the link to uh, the Digital Europe program might be very promising to go further on the same path. Um, before we hand over to a particular case, it's maybe good to uh, summarize what we speak about if we refer to Eli the Elise universe. Uh, so the action has uh, done a lot over years. Uh, there is a portfolio of studies, guidelines, there are also tools. As I said, there are these series of webinars, there's trainings, uh, e-learning trainings, and so on and so on. And the basic idea is, okay, this is already published on join up, of course, you can find the documents, the reports, whatever. Uh, but we think that sharing and transferring the knowledge can be done even better. Uh, and it's not always very easy to find your way through the rich portfolio, the rich uh, universe of elites. So the, the, the starting question is a little bit, uh, how can I find my way throughout this rich uh, universe? And I will give one example. Um, yeah, at the right, you see a very complex picture. It's not the elites universe yet, but it's the Earth observation and geospatial universe that we have captured in a body of knowledge. And that's how this universe is looking like. But usually these universes are quite complex. There are many aspects to it. So uh, for example, one example is I'm interested in geospatial artificial intelligence in particular. Uh, Elise did something on that, but how can I find the related resources? Um, so how can I find the right resources, but also how should I go through it? What should I read first or follow first the video or webinar? So a kind of learning path, an optimal learning path. What are related concepts to GeoAI? 
what will I, at the end of the day I will learn? So what are the objectives? So this is more advanced querying of your universe that should be made possible if you use knowledge graph semantic technologies uh, at large. So a few concepts or a few definitions. Um, well, we speak sometimes throughout the webinar about what we call ELISA concepts. Uh, in practice that are single or multiple words describing a theory, method, technology, a solution, a service that are well-defined and or described in the LISA resources that might have an acronym and that are uh, used consistently throughout the ELISA action. Then we have the ELISA resources themselves. As we said, it's very variable, it's broad, it's infographics, it's real operational tools, it is videos, webinars, reports, uh, many things, uh, even news, uh, it can be even on Twitter, etc. So it's, let's say, a rich and a variable, a very uh, diverse uh, uh, set of resources. Um, a key other concept in the work we have done is, of course, knowledge transfer. And uh, we see knowledge transfer as a process where uh, we have knowledge, ideas, experience, facts, whatever, that are moving from the source of knowledge to a recipient of knowledge that might be public authorities, might be uh, professionals working in these pu public authorities, but it might be also be people from universities, from private sector, etc from the commission and so on and so on. So knowledge transfer and knowledge sharing are often used interchangeably. It's not the same. We can have a very theoretical discussion on that. We'll not do it today. Uh, but often in literature, you will find back uh, these two terms. Of course, uh, if you have knowledge and you have resources like the ones from Elise, you need to manage all of this. And there we state that it is this process of capturing, distributing, but also effectively promoting and using uh, the knowledge. Um, to a side note here is that in the context of the European qualification framework, um, uh, knowledge is described rather as theoretical and factual, and it does not include necessary skills transfer or transfer of competences that are called now in EQF autonomy. Uh, so the focus of Elise is rather on knowledge and partially to a certain degree also on skills. So that should be kept in mind when we uh, speak about this. Okay, then I will briefly introduce the knowledge graphs themselves, but then I will hand over to Oscar a little bit later because he will uh, explore and exploit and explain uh, what they have done in Spain, especially in Zaragoza. Uh, so the starting point is a little bit that knowledge graphs is, is not entirely new. It's also related to other developments. Usually we refer a lot to the semantic web. Uh, to the management of semantic assets. Uh, we also come back to that later on because that has been reused from ISA Square program. Uh, but the, the heart of the knowledge graph is a kind of model, a collection of interlinked descriptions of concepts, entities, very important to relationships. If you don't have relationships, there is not much in a, in a knowledge graph, but it can be also events. Um, and in the context of ELISE, we have focused a lot the entity as concepts, the content, but also as the resources of ELISE that can be interconnected. So, but key element or key message here is about all the relationships that can you find. For example, in Friend of a Friend, it's a, an example uh, of an ontology where uh, you describe persons and uh, persons with names and you relate them to each other. Uh, you might have heard already from uh, of uh, certain knowledge graphs. Um, here is a, a list. Not it's not well. It, the list is a lot longer, but uh, DBpedia. You might have heard about it or even used it. Wikidata is very popular. WordNet more and more. Uh, we used it also in other contexts, etc. And you see then this, for example, DBpedia. These figures that show the knowledge graph. The, the rich universe, uh, in this case, the, of DPpedia. And if you zoom in, you can, of course, uh, zoom in on, partic on particular parts of the graph. So that will come back. You will see it in the examples that will be shown in the uh, case studies that we uh, will present. 
Uh, if we speak about knowledge graph, again, we will not zoom in in detail. We don't have the time to do so. Uh, we can speak about an architecture of knowledge graphs where you have on the left hand in the figure a knowledge acquisition, the setup and the development of the ontology, the data lifting, it will be explained uh, how we have done that in Elise, the data annotation eventually, but also certainly quality assurance. And on, on the other side of the graph or of the figure, you have uh, the knowledge consumption, the usage, and it's the understanding of the knowledge graph and the exploitation. And that can go from very basic summaries graphically to uh, more advanced semantic queries, uh, query generation, automated yes or no, et cetera. And of course the knowledge graph is somehow stored. Uh, I think with that, I stop my introduction uh, and I will hand over to the case study uh, for Oscar, so I will go away. Oscar, can you yep. say something? Okay, we hear you. I hear. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Danny, for the uh, for the introduction. Uh, I think that I mean you can go next already. As uh, Danny has been commenting, I will be I will be especially talking about one of the the use cases uh, that has been uh, selected uh, in, in this initial uh, stages of uh, reviewing. Yeah, what, what has been done uh, in the context in this case of public administration. And uh, I mean, like, uh, basically, uh, we wouldn't be able to understand the, the work that we have been doing in the in the knowledge graph of Zaragoza, of the city of Zaragoza in Spain, without actually understanding what is the overall context uh, in the context of Spanish municipalities. I mean, the work that we have been doing for a good amount of years uh, in terms of making sure that the Spanish municipalities can start producing open data, open government data in an homogeneous manner. So this is basically what I'm going to be uh, talking about yeah, uh, now. So go next, yeah. Um, the, uh, the context, uh, uh, I mean, and the, the, the final uh, or most recent uh, project that we have been involved in, and it's not just a, a project, I mean, it's really like the, uh, the final stage of uh, lots of activities that we have been doing over uh, many, many years, uh, is this uh, project called Ciudades Abiertas, Open Cities, um, which was mainly focused on uh, going a little bit further on open government and interoperability across uh, different municipalities. And in fact, there were may, uh, four main municipalities uh, uh, in Spain that were involved over here. Zaragoza is the leader, uh, but also Madrid, uh, the city of uh, Santiago de Compostela, and also A Coruña. Uh, go next. Uh, which were the main areas that uh, they were working on. I mean, it was not only uh, let's publish an open uh, uh, knowledge graphs and, and that's all. Uh, in fact, I mean, they, they were uh, looking at this, I mean, from a very high level, uh, from an open government perspective, where there are three, four areas of work, yeah? Uh, citizen participation, uh, transparency, uh, but mainly, I mean, and the one that is uh, most interesting for us uh, right now, open data and ontologies, yeah? Open data uh, understood as the way, I mean, to, to provide our open government data following all the uh, open data directives and uh, uh, national legislations, and also even the auto-imposed uh, uh, legislations and uh, norms inside cities, and also ontologies, because as Danny has been commenting before, uh, knowledge graphs cannot be understood uh, uh, without ontologies, and uh, there is a lot of work that we have been doing on ontology development and ontology governance uh, for, for cities. So if we go next, uh, uh, we could actually ask ourselves, why do we need ontologies for open data publication? Why do we need, we need ontologies for knowledge graph uh, publication? Uh, well, basically, I mean, uh, when we are providing open data, uh, it would be really nice to publish following the same data structures. Yeah, Just imagine different cities willing to provide data, for instance, about the transport or mobility. Some of them will be using DTFS. Some of them will be using their own CSVs. Some of them will be using web services. Uh, and in fact, I mean, uh, you, you have over there on the bottom several examples of how different cities are publishing their, their data. Uh, so uh, this goes against the principle that, uh, I mean, most developers and producers would like to use, which is develop once and deploy everywhere. So this was the initial uh, overview that we had when we were working with uh, municipalities in Spain. Uh, they already uh, identified uh, this problem. And then, I mean, we started going towards trying to make this more homogeneous. So if we go next, uh, I have over there a couple of pointers uh, that I will share later as well. 
uh, on a bit of history on the uh, on this process. Um, uh, there is a, 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 um, an association of municipalities in Spain, which is called FEMB, uh, the Federation of Spanish Municipalities and Provinces, where, which is like a neutral space for all municipalities and provinces in Spain to talk about problems that they have and to talk about solutions and next steps and so on. Uh, so in this context, there was a, a very rich group and informed by many, many different stakeholders uh, working on open data, yeah, uh, which developed, I mean, I was part of that group, uh, an open data guide in 2017, and then the second edition is from 2019, where there were like, I mean, key elements that any municipality, independently of their size, could actually use in order to start uh, focusing on their open data roadmaps, yeah. Um, if we go next, we will see uh, uh, what uh, we had in the 2019 case, which was not only the recommendations and lots of uh, tips and tricks, yeah, coming from those ones who were leading, but also a selection of 40 data sets uh, that would be like the priority data sets, something similar to the high value data sets that are being now discussed uh, in the context of the latest uh, open data directive uh, for all municipalities to publish, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. This is an ongoing process. I mean, this doesn't mean that they have it already, that all municipalities in Spain have them. Uh, but uh, I mean, what we have been doing slowly is not just only doing the characterization of the data sets, but also identifying which are those data sets that have been published, and uh, which are the ontologies that we need, the vocabularies that we need in order to publish this properly, so that we can go from the isolated data sets that are normally appearing in the open data portals to really rich and interconnected knowledge graphs that will allow us to exploit in a much better way uh, all this richness of data that uh, we have inside municipalities. So all this has been done in the context of the thematic network on open data and smart cities that I was leading, in the context of this project, uh, Ciudades Abiertas, Open Cities, and in many other uh, initiatives that we are doing. So if we go next, we have uh, the rest of uh, data sets as well. I mean, the up-to-date information can be found uh, in that link, and if we go next, uh, you can see, I mean, that there is a, a, a website that we are maintaining where we are describing what is the status where we are. In some cases, we only have the data set identified. In some other cases, we have already like the second or third version of the ontologies vocabularies that now uh, many cities are being using, are, are using for their uh, knowledge graph. And there is a lot of ongoing work. I mean, part of it, I mean, I'm funded uh, with master thesis. Uh, I mean, which are supervised by city officials, for instance, from the city of Madrid, some of them uh, funded by different projects or initiatives or even by municipalities because they have interest on this. So if we go next, uh, now uh, we, we can go into how do we manage uh, ontologies? How do we manage these initial steps towards creating the, the knowledge graphs? Uh, basically, I mean, we, we, we have to count with a very rich set of stakeholders, yeah? from the open data and transparency city officials, from different cities to the teams of ontology engineers uh, to a very clear process of ontology governance, appointed city experts for each of the vocabularies data sets. If we are talking about mobility, we want the experts uh, from mobility, the data engineers from the city, the ones who have to maintain the databases uh, and also API and app developers. So that's just a list of uh, some of the people who have been uh, working with us in this context. If you want to understand a little bit more, uh, you will find uh, very quickly uh, in, in the next slide, um, like uh, some links to uh, a couple of uh, uh, presentations from uh, ontology governance, the need for open data governance. I have put also on the chat uh, some of these links so that you can have them available and you can browse them later if you wish. So let's go now into this last uh, five minutes of my presentation into the case uh, of Zaragoza. Yeah? What have we done in Zaragoza? Uh, basically, again, the link is on the chat already. Uh, you can find uh, like a uh, report uh, that describes uh, the work that we have been doing over these 10 years uh, of work. I mean, it's just a summary of what is the status, the current status of uh, the knowledge graph of Zaragoza. And I would say it's not really like the current status, it's the status that we had two years ago. So things are evolving and this is a very important thing to, uh, to discuss as well. So if we go next, um, uh, basically, I mean, if, if we go into any, any, uh, any city, uh, that has an open data portal, we will find something similar to what we are seeing over here. This is what we can find in uh, datos.saragosa.es, uh, where we have uh, the data API, uh, we have the catalog of data sets, 
Uh, but I mean, uh, at the same time, we have also a REST API, which is powered by the by the knowledge graph. Uh, we have also Sparkle endpoint. I mean, I, I don't want to go into many details, technical details on this presentation, but I'm happy to, to answer questions uh, afterwards. Uh, and we also have uh, the vocabularies, the vocabularies that are currently being used uh, in the knowledge graph. So all these elements are coming together in the in the open data portal uh, of Zaragoza, so that those users uh, that are using the, the data portal do not really need to understand that there is a knowledge graph behind the scenes. What they see is a common open data portal where they can interact with the data. And also if they are a little bit more tech savvy and they understand a little bit more how to exploit graphs, then they will be able to run those Sparkle queries or to go into the REST APIs and see uh, the results in uh, JSON-LD, uh, Tartle, apart from the uh, other usual formats uh, that are being used by many, uh, many other developers. So in the next slide, and without really willing to, to go into many details, and sorry that there are a couple of things in Spanish over there, uh, but I mean, we can just see uh, the, the ingredients, yeah, the technical ingredients that we have in that architecture. Yeah? The REST API, where we have behind the scenes relational databases, which are common in, the, uh, in, in this type of uh, in municipalities, in the information systems that they use, the static files, the web services that they are accessing, everything also available in Sparkle endpoint so that uh, people can interact with it, but also in solar, for instance, just to, to generate faceted search uh, systems. So this shows, I mean, that uh, whenever we are thinking about knowledge graphs, we cannot just think about the usual technology only that we should be, uh, that we would be using uh, in the context of RDF, Sparkle, and so on. We also have to think uh, from a more comprehensive uh, point of view uh, so that it can be actually used uh, with many different uh, profiles or many different views, uh, uh, the same information uh, for many different types of developers. So that's one of the main lessons learned. We go next, and I mean, uh, what we have now over there is uh, really like a little bit of the ongoing work, the current work that Zaragoza is doing. Uh, so for instance, now uh, Zaragoza is developing uh, their data space for the, for the city, where they are doing a combination of the use of thematic maps, dashboards, indicators, the data generated by the city council, as well as those that are being generated by citizens. So there will be very interesting reports uh, coming up uh, from uh, data.europa.eu, uh, where I have been involved, where we will be talking about uh, all these things, recommendations to make open data more reusable, and also uh, how to incorporate citizen generated data uh, in data sources, where some of the examples of Zaragoza will be also uh, shown. If we go next, then, I mean, we have the typical access points yeah, to, to all these uh, elements. So these are part of the new interfaces that are going to be made available to access uh, the, the knowledge graph. I mean, not, nothing, uh, nothing really relevant. You will be able to play with it if you, if you wish. And I would like to finish yeah, uh, in this last minute with a couple of recommendations and main messages for other municipalities in Spain. Uh, has been leading uh, a kind of the, the open data developments in Spain for, for quite a while. Uh, I mean, and there are several messages that are also coming across this uh, Spanish Federation of Municipalities and Provinces. First of all, this idea of open data by default, yeah, and uh, knowledge graphs by default. So the municipality services are the first reducers of their own open data, of their own knowledge graph. They don't consider the open data portal as a data graveyard, a place where you put your data and then you forget about it. And data sets are not alone. They, they come with APIs and practically uh, the knowledge graphs are actually for this. There's also this view on the uh, proper open data governance. You, you have to avoid duplication of data across your information systems. And knowledge graphs are uh, essential on this. Yeah? The, their principles are, are, are key for this, the, the idea of unique identifiers. Uh, but not only the technical side, also the governance side, yeah? processes and people, multidisciplinary teams that are uh, really necessary over here and that allow us to combine data with maps, dashboards, indicators, and so on. And the final message, homogenization. Uh, this wouldn't be done alone by, by the city. Uh, we need uh, uh, homogenization inside the city with common patterns to, to describe data and also across cities, as I have been showing you in Ciudades Abiertas or in the, uh, in the Spanish Federation of Municipalities and Provinces uh, catalog. So that's all. Uh, I will be happy to, to discuss on technical things or, or more details on the experiences, but I mean, I just wanted to give you an overview uh, from very high level to, to the more uh, detailed level of uh, what Zaragoza has been doing. Thank you, Oscar. Very interesting. 
And I remind all the participants, we are in the meantime about 100 people. Uh, you can put in the chat your questions. Maybe we are not able to discuss them all in detail, but you can get in contact with Oscar to get more information or to discuss particular issues, but we will um, uh, look back to the questions at the end of the session. Uh, okay, uh, I will now briefly uh, take over for a few minutes uh, to uh, inform you about what we have done in the context of ELISE to manage concepts in uh, a common glossary for ELISE uh, and how we try to also to link to other vocabularies and glossaries and ontologies. Very briefly, because the, there will be more in the report on, on the work done. Uh, first of all, there is a difference between, of course, between glossaries, vocabularies, and ontologies. Again, I will not start a scientific discussion, but let's say that a glossary is more uh, um, a simple list of terms uh, in a particular domain uh, with their definitions, let's say. While a vocabulary is going a little bit further, uh, you might have a collection of words in a particular field or prepared for a particular purpose often for learning, but not only. So you have also several vocabularies in the context of the ISA Square program. Ontologies, on the other hand, are looking more into uh, the complexity of a particular field, focusing on this field, but also looking more into the relationships between uh, the concepts defined, uh, So, uh, but very much formalized. To just give one example, currently the European Space Agency is developing a particular ontology on the subsector of uh, positioning, navigation, and timing. It's not yet ready, but it's upcoming as an example. On the other hand, uh, if we speak about in a glossary, uh, I give in the blue box an example of uh, a, uh, a term or a concept that has been defined in the context of ELISA is, for example, location-enabled public services. The definition is there that is defined in one of the ELISA resources. You can also argue if that's a very good definition, if you need to fine tune the definition and you can find it back in this particular uh, ELISA resource. So uh, in the context of ELISA, what we have done is to go through or analyze all the ELISA resources to get where possible, uh, the definitions eventually link to examples or case studies, etc. That is what was a little bit the starting point. Uh, uh, and uh, the end point or the end result of this Elise glossary is, uh, as you see in the blue box, we have uh, at the end of the day, 254 concepts that were retained in two levels. Uh, some concepts that were defined were a little bit too broad or maybe not really related to Elise action, so we dropped them. But let's say we uh, uh, retained at the end a very rich uh, glossary uh, with their definitions, uh, in some cases more than one definition. Um, you see some examples of what is in the core glossary, that is the glossary that will be uh, uploaded or that will replace the current glossary of Elise, and then the second level uh, concepts uh, that are related or not, but uh, that are retained, that are important enough, but that might not be published in the join up as it is now. One example, I pick one example out of it is the application programming interface. Everyone knows it, API. While at the second level, you have a related term is API gateway as an example. The second example is location data privacy as a more generic concept and as a sub concept for AAA mechanisms is the authorization aspect, for example. So, but for all of these, so in total, uh, these 250 plus uh, concepts are, uh, has been collected in, in the glossary. Um, we found out that some uh, ELISA resources are probably containing a lot of con other concepts that have not been defined because there was not a glossary table or there was not a section on definitions, etc. So we used also or experimented with uh, text mining techniques to uh, try to find a, a more systematic list of concepts used in the different uh, ELISA resources. Uh, it's a very interesting technique to find out, and in, in practice, it's one of the recommendations will be that when developing the ELISA resource or from 
other resources, of course, in the future, other programs, other initiatives, it would be good to go to use text mining techniques to establish glossary lists and uh, tables in uh, resource. That has not been done systematically, but it's very interesting also from the perspective of uh, quality control. There are several open source tools for doing that. Uh, we used uh, and tested several. Uh, but we ended up with the sketch, sketch engine and one-click terms, but uh, there are other options, uh, of course. Uh, then in the next step, what we did is starting from the glossaries to try to enrich uh, the glossary data set also with synonyms, but not only synonyms, also hypernyms and hyponyms and very similar concepts we eventually could find. And there the focus was on experimenting whether we could do that automatically. Now, it was not always possible. So we had a very rich uh, uh, number of resources. It's in the next slide. But uh, we had also some glossaries that were obvious to look into uh, with a manual scan. Uh, one of them is not listed here, but is the ISO TC211 um, uh, glossary or a list of terms and definitions. Um, and at the right side in the blue box, you see the ones that were uh, rather processed automatically uh, with the synonyms finder. It's part of the ISA Square uh, tools that has been developed in uh, ELISA uh, Action as well, but in another project. Uh, and with that tool, uh, some of the bigger ones could be also processed automatically. Uh, uh, searching for uh, synonyms and uh, uh, related concepts. So at the end, uh, we also, in that context, contacted and worked with some of the organizations that are mentioned in the yellow box. Uh, I, in fact, they are, the, the list is longer, but that are the most important ones. Uh, so in total, uh, 32 external sources were analyzed, 23 were in practice used because some were less relevant at the end of the day. So 16 were manually processed, the smaller ones, and seven automatically. Of course, you can't automatically use the uh, synonyms finder. It depends on the setup of the glossary or the vocabulary, whether you are able to do it. Uh, at the end, we found more than 100 synonyms for the 250 plus uh, um, terms that were defined in the glossary. Uh, the work process, I will not go through it, but is described in the report that will be made public uh, soon. Uh, so there you can find uh, more details. And of course, it would be good to go further on this path to enrich uh, the um, ELISA um, um, world that descri is described by those concepts. And with that, I want to hand over to my colleague, Mark Oleislager, who will briefly explain how uh, or what we did related to the knowledge graph implementation uh, for the ELISA action. Please, Mark. Okay. Um, so for in the ELISA action, there were a lot of um, outputs that we call it uh, produced. Uh, and this uh, provides a rich knowledge base um, that we want to exploit and, and make available in a, in a flexible way. Um, and for that, uh, we wanted to experiment and as a prototype, create a, a knowledge graph uh, that describes this uh, knowledge base from the, these outputs. Um, for this, we started by uh, creating a knowledge matrix, which is more or less a list of all the outputs that, um, that were produced, um, but with a lot of attributes and a lot of linked fields. Um, it's an Excel, but it's not really a structured database in itself because there are um, different sheets. Uh, sometimes it starts at, at different lines. Sometimes only a few columns uh, belong to each other and, and the column next to it is already another object or another um, code list. There are, um, there are cells that contain multiple values. Um, sometimes like you see in the gray columns, there's something like uh, not applicable, which is not a real value. So this had to be filtered out. So it's not, uh, well, it's it's rich information, but it's not really knowledge. You cannot really um, start this to, to, to look for things or to mine things or to, to start um, connecting things. 
uh, what is all in this matrix is, and so it's not only the output and all the attributes with it but we also have a, a separate sheet for the contributors we have organizations uh, case studies that are mentioned or used in in the in the different studies we have the policies where things are related to and then a number of code lists um, of course we try to reuse code lists that already exist but there are also code lists that we that uh, well we just created from the the topics and the, the for example the keywords that were mentioned in the different outputs so the first step when you want to create a knowledge graph is, is um, building a model. Um, and for this, we um, in this prototype, we really um, try to be um, yeah, a little bit reusing things that already existed and, and that we want to link to. For example, in join up, um, the data there, there's the, the ADMS, um, application profile for join up so uh, we want to link to that we want to yeah, to communicate with that so we started um, with uh, adms as as the base for our um, our knowledge graph and then we extend that using existing vocabularies or linking to existing uh, classes and so on um, i i say define classes and properties but that's really only if it's needed and then we use subclassing and sub properties uh, for things that we define new so all with the focus on uh, using existing vocabularies and so on with the focus on um, be able to link to external data sources not only the the join up um, sparkle endpoint for example but uh, there are a lot of other data sets available for example even also uh, we keep wiki data and so on. Okay, so um, we have the Elise resource, which is the it's a, a decad asset. Uh, we have distributions from that, but then it expands around that with, uh, with attributes and with classes that we link to it. Now we have, of course, our data in Excel, and we have to transform them to uh, our knowledge graph structure. Um, so this is called data lifting. and there are a number of tools available for this. Um, we have, for example, Open Refine, which is a, a GUI that is uh, yeah, quite easy to use. Um, but because we are prototyping and because the idea was also um, try to create a methodology that is um, reusable and that is repeatable in an easy way, um, we looked in um, in mapping rules, so instead of really doing the mapping in a, in a GUI, trying to define mapping rules, uh, and then you can reapply them whenever you want. Uh, for these mapping rules, um, we looked in, in different uh, directions, but we ended up with uh, RML, uh, which builds on uh, R2 RML, um, and which can, uh, well, which can be used to build rules to convert from um spreadsheets um to uh to a knowledge graph to to triples um this sounds easy if you if you tell it like that but in the end the problem is that our excel uh, contained very like i already said very different things um so uh these rules in itself were not enough we have to to build let's say an extra layer over it um what we did is we simplified the, the Excel file in, in different uh, CSV files, uh, which can then be easily used as input for, uh, for the final transformation. Uh, we looked, and of course, because the RML is just a, a way to define the rules, you also need an, an application that can apply these rules. Uh, we looked at uh, different things. We looked at RML Mapper and at uh, SDM Artifizer. Um, and just for practical reasons, uh, because, for example, also the, the synonyms tool, it's all written in, uh, in Python. So we selected uh, SDM Artifizer as, as tool. OK, you can go to the next slide. So, um, this is still work in progress. We are still updating the, the knowledge matrix, uh, yeah, the knowledge matrix, so the Excel file, which already 
then gives us the opportunity to, to prove that we are creating a reusable uh, methodology because every update in the knowledge matrix can easily be um, transformed to, to a new knowledge graph that contains all the new information. Um, to visualize the results and to, to, um, to question it uh, using, uh, we used Sparkle, it's also mentioned before already, so that's a query language for uh, knowledge graphs, just like SQL is one for uh, relational databases. So we use the GraphDB as a, as a tool where we can visualize um, the, the knowledge graph. Uh, and this is just a view of the knowledge graph. You see it's a lot of uh, circles. All these circles are different uh, concepts in different classes uh, in our knowledge graph. Just as an overview, um, at, the, at the current moment, this morning, we had uh, five, more than 500 outputs from uh, more than 350 contributors that belong to almost 200 organizations. And all these outputs and all these uh, people are and, and organizations, they are all um, tagged with attributes that gives us the opportunity to, to filter and select and combine um, information in our knowledge graph. So we have, for example, activity types, where you say, okay, this is a webinar, this is a report, this is a serious game, this is, um, yeah, all, all different kinds that, that, that is, that's possible. It, so we had uh, more than 50 different activity types. Um, in a lot of these types, like we, for example, today we have the Saragossa uh, use case. So these use cases are also all filtered out of the, the outputs and, and are available so in, in, in a separate, um, as a separate class. So we can really start interlinking with all these uh, information. So this is our result, but of course now the real, uh, interesting part only begins. Um, what can you do with the knowledge graph? So what are the use cases um, for what do you want to use a knowledge graph? Of course, relatively, we have only 500 outputs. So it's not that we have a big data data set, um, but that doesn't mean that, uh, that the knowledge graph does not give us uh, in, a, in a very flexible way, a lot of information that's often probably also possible in a relational database, um, but the knowledge graph gives in some ways a, a more flexible way to, to mine data. Um, and of course, the advantage of a knowledge graph is also the graphical presentation. Uh, overall, we have like four, well, three types of, of, uh, um, of use cases and that we that I will demonstrate with a very small example, and of course you can go further with that, really with big data, with uh, artificial intelligence, and so on. But what we did in, and what we are um, prototyping and testing now is um, is the three first use cases. So we have the quality assurance, for example, get all the duplicates of uh, contributors and organizations to make sure that uh, that every contributor is only one um, one entity in the in the knowledge graph so all links to that contributor are all to the to the real to the correct um, instance um, so we use the the knowledge graph um, using sparkle queries um, to filter these things out uh, for example you can also filter out uh, where for an output, a public name is missing, um, but there are a lot of things that you can uh, can check like that. Um, and you can, no, no, that's too fast. <laughs> okay, the second type of, uh, of uh, things is the real, well, the summary of your uh, knowledge graph. That's one of the reasons also why we wanted to do this work at this moment in time, um, because we have the, the ELISA action uh, where we have a final report and we want to, to be able to, to give some um, interesting information about the outputs of the ELISA uh, ecosystem of the ELISA universe. Um, so we use the, the knowledge graph to, to 
to produce some of those summary numbers. Uh, for example, get the number of webinars, get the case studies that related to more than one ELISE output, get the count of outputs by uh, EIF layer, and so on. So um, it's really querying the database, the, the knowledge graph, but, but using a different um, different ways of, of uh, grouping things, of counting things, uh, combining different uh, attributes or different links in the knowledge graph. Um, and that gives us a nice overview of, of, uh, of what Elisa did. And of course, further, if you, like um, the other um, main reason of this is, of course, that all this information that's available, we also want to, um, to transfer this knowledge and to be able to transfer it, it has to be um, discoverable and, and easily searchable. So there's the question answering that, that can be used for this. And that means that, that um, people who are interested can search for certain outputs related to keywords, related to actions, related to whatever that's in the knowledge base. Uh, for example, um, you want to look at an organization and see to what outputs they contributed. Um, maybe the next question is, is one of the previous one. Um, what was done and what activities and what topics uh, were, were most um, addressed in 2020? Um, what policies are not covered by Elise and so on. So it's a lot of questions that you can ask the knowledge base. Um, and the fact that we have this knowledge graph makes this very flexible. Further exploitation is already mentioned before. You can start using artificial intelligence, um, but already much easier as you can start linking to external knowledge graphs. And that's why you reuse um, as much as possible existing vocabularies, for example, because then you can very easily start linking. Okay, now let's look at the first example. Um, this is a, a validation use case. So when we transfer data from the Excel sheet to our uh, knowledge graph, normally for each output, well, some someone produced that output. So there has to be an organization and there have to be uh, contributors related to that. So a very simple question can be, give us all the um, all the outputs that don't have a related contributor. That contributor can then be a, a, a person or it can be an organization or a boat. And of course, it's not one-on-one. -on -one. There can be more organizations. There can be more um, contributors as per, in personal. So this is a query that you can also um, ask in a relational database, but these things are also very easy um, to do in a, in a knowledge graph. And, and you can really start combining a lot of, um, of different attributes and classes. For example, you could say, well, if there's a, a person related to uh, output and that person is not related to, um, to an organization, then maybe it's not needed that there's an organization linked to, um, to an output. Um, maybe a side remark here is that um, you can also start um, adding information using the knowledge graph. Uh, for example, if the organization is not directly linked to the um, to the output, but there are um, there are contributors uh, as person linked to the output, and these contributors they are linked themselves to an organization, then we can use this to create directly the link from the output to the organization where that person belongs to. So we can not only validate the data, but we can also uh, sometimes in an in a automatic or semi-automatic way um, update and correct the information. So that's the first use case. Second use case is, well, let's let's try to produce some um, some nice summaries of what we did in Elise. Uh, this is only one example. Um, in the report, there will be a lot of numbers and overviews like this. Um, all the outputs are linked to policy domains. Um, we can um, give overviews of this. Group things by policy domain. We used um, 
GraphDB as, as, uh, as interface for this, so you can very easily uh, transfer your results also to, to a normal chart. It doesn't have to be a, a graph uh, view. So here we have a chart that just gives us the numbers of outputs that are, um, that are tagged with, for example, data economy, it's more than 460. So again, this is a, an attribute that is not one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, output can be linked to more than one um, policy domain. So the sum of all is, of course, much more than, than the 500 outputs that we have. Okay. Uh, for this, uh, this is an, uh, a way to ask questions to the knowledge graph. For example, you could ask um, which for organization X, in what um, outputs did they contribute that are related to policy domain Y? Um, I could ask the run the query, but then you only see the output. But nice thing of knowledge graphs is that you can visualize it. So what we have here is in the, the middle, the green dot is a policy domi domain um, data economy. And, we, and the blue dots are all the outputs um, that are tagged to this policy domain. Then we have on the, on the right bottom, we have the organization, um, which in this case is KU Leuven. Um, and we then also have all the outputs that are where KU Leuven was a contributor. And then you see um, that separate part of blue dots that's exactly all the outputs that are linked both to KU Leuven and to the policy domain of um, data economy. So if you really run the query, that would be the set of outputs um, that would be in your list. But of course, this is a much nicer representation if you want to have an overview on yeah, is that uh, what's, for example, related to the total number of, of, uh, of outputs linked to that policy domain. So this is a very nice way to, to, uh, to give such views. And with this, I think that uh, we covered those use cases and we are well in time. So can I give Thank you, time? Mark, for providing us a glimpse of what you can do with knowledge graphs. It should be stressed that this is just prototyping, experimenting, not something fully operational. Um, I will go first to the conclusions, maybe a little bit a strange way of doing things or order of things, but I will give first uh, one slight conclusion of what has been already uh, uh, discussed before. And then I want to hand over to Andre Skupin uh, also to look forward to the future and to new ongoing things in a more advanced way, not only knowledge graphs, but other techniques to manage knowledge and to uh, transfer knowledge. Um, so conclusions uh, on all the things said and heard so far is that um, in organizations, but also for individuals uh, alike, uh, it's usually a quite a big challenge to find your way in a certain domain. In this case, it's uh, Elise Action, which ran over several years. Uh, there is a rich portfolio of resources and outputs uh, generated by this action. Um, but it's usually very difficult in a traditional way to explore it, to find your way uh, through this, uh, for example, even on a good documented website like JoinUp. Uh, so we think that knowledge graphs might help to uh, uh, facilitate that. And then uh, second, and secondly, we have seen that uh, uh, knowledge graphs can really provide a good overview of the lease universe and, and the lease resources, what has been generated, uh, but also it allows to query in with more traditional questions, but or also more advanced questions, although the most more advanced questions we still need to explore more, I think. Uh, but uh, this can help uh, already to uh, facilitate and support the knowledge transfer process. And then 
uh, we have also seen um, that um, with the case of Zaragoza, uh, that uh, knowledge graphs are not only for scientific or uh, educational institutes or whatever, but it is also very, it can be made operational for municipalities, for example, in the context of digital government, it can really facilitate and help to exploit and also to interact with citizens and between uh, officials from uh, cities but also from regions of course it's not uh, included also only uh, at the local level i've put here already some conclusions on uh, the story of andres kupin but uh, in order not to delay uh, further i want to hand over to andre andre are you there yeah perfect I am here. The sun has not yet risen in San Diego, but I am here. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning from San Diego. Um, next, please. So um, I want to uh, sort of, as Danny alluded to, broaden the perspective a little bit um, to include knowledge graphs uh, and other approaches to really providing contextual intelligence. In other words, understanding knowledge in its various forms uh, in their proper context in a given situation. Next. Um, and really what we're all struggling with and what you're addressing, what you've addressed in the Elise project are basically inefficiencies in our knowledge ecosystems where we all are actors that produce and consume knowledge artifacts through our various activities. But uh, what we're really interested in and you we're starting to get there, uh, and it was a very nice set of examples from Zaragoza as well, um, specific questions that you're trying to address, problems that you're trying to solve. And our proposal, next please, is basically to, uh, to say, well, remember the L in Elise stands for location. And we very much draw inspiration from that to say, what if there was a common space? In location management, we take it for granted that we have locational reference systems into which we are projecting. And can we do that for uh, knowledge spaces as well? And what would that look like? And how would that help us answering the actual knowledge related um, questions? Um, next, please. And if you had such a knowledge space, what you can then do is you can project your artifacts, your activities, your people into that space. So for example, an organization, be it a governmental uh, organization, an educational or, or a business organization um, has a certain profile, things it does, things it needs to know. Um, and uh, in that same space, you would want to represent, say a job ad, an open position or a currently filled position. Maybe someone is retiring. And you know, trying to find a, a person to fill that position with a, a view of the future to where this person can do what, what the current job requires, but grows with the company. So as the company moves in this knowledge space, perhaps expands or pivots its footprint in the knowledge space that the person can grow with it. And what if we could uh, do almost like a Boolean intersection of, of these various types of, uh, of um, artifacts. And so, uh, next please, if we draw our attention, again, the L stands for location in Elise. So let's draw some inspiration from geographic information science. And it turns out, if we look at this quote from Helen Kuklelis, now 30 years ago, what this is pointing to is that there are uh, multiple ways of conceptualizing reality. And here it was applied to geographic space, to location information, but it's also applicable to knowledge spaces. And what this is pointing to is that there are two basic ways of looking at reality that in GIS we take for granted. One is the world as occupied by discrete objects, people, cars, houses, roads, bridges. But the other is the world is occupied by continuous phenomena, continuous fields like temperature, humidity that exist everywhere simultaneously. There is no absence ever of them, uh, just with different magnitude. Uh, next, please. And what if we use that larger perspective on spaces and apply it to knowledge spaces? So one might argue that 
the knowledge graph approach, the ontology approach, triple stores, graph databases, uh, really are representative of a discrete object view of the world, that there are things and you can connect these things, you have certain relationships to each other. But it turns out, next please, there is perhaps an additional perspective that corresponds to the, to the continuous field view of the world. And we find terms like feature space, high dimensional space, multivariate clustering, dimensionality reduction, projection. Now, natural language processing and machine learning uh, is a mix of the two uh, in that uh, there are techniques in natural language processing. For example, Danny mentioned uh, WordNet uh, that are definitely a graph type representation. And then there are others that are heavily in, in feature space. And you can see snapshots here of some of our tools that support these, um, these viewpoints. Now, if uh, next, please. Now, if we look at what it means to provide context through spatial intelligence, it turns out even the dictionary definitions of context provide already a larger perspective. The first one of these talks about objects and entities that surround the thing you're interested in. But then the other two definitions, two and three, they talk about something a little bit more fuzzy, settings, frames. And to me, those point to um, some underlying space, some continuous space into which, uh, in which you're um, describing, prescribing, delineating um, context. Next, please. And that's what we've been trying to build um, um, at, at Big Knowledge. We will very much take inspiration from the way geographic information systems, cartography, locational reference systems have operate and that we say, let's take a knowledge domain like geospatial technology and build a reference system through intense measurement. Uh, we typically use about 100,000 artifacts to do that and then build a multi-scale base map. That is not a new idea. Here's a textbook from the year 1901 and uh, and provide what we would now call semantic scaling inspired by these old cartographic principles but then it shouldn't just be a pretty picture there has to be an inference engine underneath to where you could take for example all your elise artifacts and project them into that same space and find relationships among them and more importantly relationships to other things to glossaries and so forth and then finally, there has to be a knowledge analytics framework where you can uh, perform analytical tasks. Next. And we've started to build that and roll that out. And so this is this continuous field view of knowledge spaces. And what I failed to mention earlier, these two views, discrete objects, continuous field, are not strictly divided. Uh, the power lies in enriching each other. Uh, for example, using machine learning, uh, feature space, high dimensional space to enrich knowledge graphs and the other way around as well. Uh, and so here we have this, this interactive map of data science and analytics. Next, please. And it's zoomable. It's very much operates like you would use any web mapping tool, but it's not driven by a knowledge graph. It's, it's driven by a high dimensional model of the topic space of uh, data science and analytics. And as you zoom in, next please, you'll find that more um, detailed concepts are, are, are being revealed. And you can perform overlays. You can, you can take any text document and project it into this uh, space. And one thing that makes this different from a knowledge graph approach perhaps is that you don't necessarily need to anticipate uh, the full vocabulary, because you have a very deep uh, language model underneath, a domain language model. And we actually discovered that uh, when once the coronavirus pandemic uh, broke out, we looked into our existing base maps, and it turned out that coronavirus was a concept already contained in these base maps created um, pre-pandemic. Ne um, next, please. And, and so you can see this here, but it's a different context. In data science and analytics, coronavirus appears in a slightly different context than in uh, geospatial technology, where in 
geospatial technology, it's really embedded in spatial analysis techniques, while in, in data science and analytics, there's actually a more overarching health subdomain with, um, within that. Next, please. So now you can do overlay analysis. For example, here I took this short mission statement of the ELISE action and projected it into this data science and analytics space to find more latent, more subtle connections uh, to data science and analytics. And you can see that when mapped as a, as a discrete point, the ELISE action maps into the semantic web and natural language processing area, but especially the semantic web area. But when we release the condition, uh, relax the conditions a bit, then suddenly you see it also filling into big data analytics and how big data is used in an organizational context. Next, please. And so using this platform that you could use to enrich knowledge graphs, but that also makes uh, the underlying space actually visible and actionable, you can now uh, do things um, that, that really enrich the knowledge graph approach and do things that would be harder to do with, with knowledge graphs. Next, please. And so, for example, here you see three conference speakers projected into a common space, and you can readily see what topics they could collaborate on, where they might bring in a third, a fourth um, collaborator, and what the sum of their expertise would be, and, uh, and importantly, also where the gaps would be that you can, you can address. Next, please. And so in that manner, you can perform semantic enrichment. So for example, here I'm taking that Elise mission statement and I'm asking against um, a, a repository of 300,000 computing articles, find me, um, act as a recommendation engine and find me matching articles that you could learn up on, on, um, on what Elise is all about and what it has done. Uh, next, please. And then gap finding and gap filling. So here, we're finding absence. A, a job applicant's resume has this donut hole of, uh, of skills. So this person is roughly qualified, but there's a hole in it. And then you could ask, okay, what is it that the person does not know? And, uh, and so we're, we're finding in the smart city area, electric meters, smart grid, smart meter systems, and so forth. Next, please. And if you have that, obviously, um, it's, it's very good that all of your efforts have APIs that are being informed. And so um, we're doing that as well. So we're using uh, GeoJSON, for example, and tile mapping. And here you see QGIS ingesting these non-geographic uh, knowledge space um, inferences. Next, please. Uh, it's also important, and I know there's an interest in how to keep track of technology trends. So in these very same spaces, you can ask questions like, uh, what are trends in adoption of artificial intelligence? And what's important here is, this is not a search for the term artificial intelligence. This is a search for the concept, which is a very high dimensional region in this um, data science uh, space. And you can see here in this uh, data set of 50,000 SNT article, AI peaked in roughly 2017. Deep learning did as well, but deep learning remains at an, at an elevated level. Uh, next, please. And so um, if you want to play with this, uh, we have various deployments of this. Next, please. Um, uh, related to this domain in particular is the Open Geospatial Consortium's um, uh, Geospatial Technology Explorer that allows you to explore the uh, geospatial domain. Next, please. And then finally, uh, I will put some of these links in, in the chat so you can explore applications. Uh, like you can put your resume, for example, in and project yourself and see yourself related to readings, uh, glossaries. Uh, we're also very soon will uh, link this to Wikipedia articles so you can contextualize yourself, your activities, your, um, your actions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you, Andre. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sam, do you take over now or? Yes, I Yes. Okay. Yes. So uh, 
Thank you, thank you, Danny. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Oscar and Andre for uh, presenting us and guiding us, uh, sharing with us, the, with us the insights how uh, um, uh, improve knowledge transfer by the knowledge graphs, uh, supported also by some cases of uh, Zaragoza, of uh, uh, how. Uh, this has been done under ELISA, uh, experimenting and sandboxing, and of course, what could be even done more, as uh, it was uh, presented also in the uh, Andres presentation. So now we are still 15 minutes, so we are quite on time. Uh, we have 15 minutes still for the discussion, questions and answers. There's been, as I see in the, in the chat window, quite uh, some, some comments. But before um, we are going to, let's say, to the discussion, as mentioned at the beginning, we invited uh, four guests uh, today that uh, would be kindly asked to give some comments and takeaways from this webinar. And if possible, maybe also to address some of the, some of the questions related to the which other initiatives or in existing vocabularies, Elisa and its follow-up actions um, should look into in the future, uh, which other use cases maybe do you see in the context of ELISA and how we can uh, create uh, ecosystem out ELISA and uh, digital government transformation and collaborate regarding the knowledge transfer in the future. So not to lose much time, I would uh, invite first uh, Seth Van Holland from European Commission uh, Digi Digit uh, to share his uh, uh, point of view. Please, Seth. Thank you, Simon. Um, thanks a lot for all these interesting presentations. I think also the, uh, I'd say the high number of participants really underlines that uh, everything what is shared on knowledge graphs is really very much on the radar of uh, a lot of people. So I think, I'd say, uh, for me, it is key that we start to experiment more, or actually that we move away from experimentation and that we gradually move towards more sustainable uh, pilots and uh, infrastructure. Um, and actually, so those of you who have followed the chat, I would say one of the points which was suggested to address would be uh, what are the other initiatives or vocabularies interesting to share in the light of these presentations. Uh, I would uh, very much encourage uh, Marina from uh, the railway agency who, who is doing wonderful work on um, the creation of knowledge graphs on uh, or a knowledge graph on um, their data and i think in may there is a seminar or a workshop on the implementation of the linked data event streams specification which will be very relevant for everyone here on uh, on this call also and then again uh, apologies a little bit for the egocentrical uh, promotion but next week actually for those who would uh, be based in Brussels, do know that we have three or four spots left open uh, for a workshop on how you can use Wikibase slash Wikidata to set up your own uh, knowledge graph. Uh, so Wikibase is really, uh, I would say, uh, a lightweight approach to start experimenting. And we have two wonderful experts who will be giving a hands-on workshop with really, we're actually limiting the audience so that we can really do hands-on uh, experiments. So for those of you, the, the online spots, unfortunately, are all full, but we still have two or three seats open. Uh, I forgot the name of the hotel, but it's in Rue de la Loi somewhere. There's also free lunch. So if you're interested, please send me an email. Uh, and then um, I would say the uh, the SEMIC conference, which will take place in December um, 2022, will also be very much geared to making the data spaces work, which of course, also involves uh, a lot of kind of work on uh, infrastructure and tools for setting up these knowledge graphs. But I very much appreciated the, uh, I'd say the, what Andre kind of suggested is that at this stage, we need to combine the traditional semantics with uh, machine learning approaches like word embeddings, topic modeling, etc., so that we can also automate some of the population of uh, knowledge graphs. And I think on the call, we also have uh, Anastasia Dimu from Kai Leuven, who's doing wonderful work on that level. So there's lots of, I would say, super interesting work uh, that has to be pushed forward. Uh, but thanks a lot for organizing this session. I think it's very much needed. And there's lots of interesting content uh, to be 
presented in the months to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Seth, for sharing your views and suggestions with us. So uh, as understood, highlighted, you highlighted so to move from the from the pilots to more sustainable solutions in the future and uh, combine semantics with the uh, with the machine learning. So next one I would invite is uh, Rob Lemons from University of Twente to share his views. Please, Rob. Hi, Simon. Yes, I'm trying to switch on my camera, but that doesn't work. Um, but uh, I'll do it like this. Uh, thanks, Simon, um, Danny, and Mark. Um, I think uh, this was a very interesting session. Um, but yeah, takeaway message um, from my side. I'm, we have been uh, working with uh, a bigger community uh, uh, on data standardization um, and vocabularies for, for quite some time. Uh, also, uh, yeah, it's still alive, as we can see from the, the big participation here. Um, and uh, you see that technology uh, comes back from time to time with a different, uh, yeah, let's say, uh, look and feel. Uh, this, I think, is the next step, and it's very promising again. Um, so uh, vocabularies, ontologies, linked data, I mean, we have seen those things already around for some time. But um, I think what we now see is it becomes more practical uh, so more people can make use of it also um, yeah uh, with respect uh, to apis and, and modeling but certainly also visualization uh, that's what we see uh, what andre has um, uh, presented um, and another remark is that um, you also see the communities growing and um, certain communities uh, we see where this technology is uh, applied in a practical sense and i would also like to mention for instance um, the mapping agencies um, for instance the cadastres the dutch cadaster has also done quite some work in the recent years also to uh, create linked data out of uh, their uh, quite uh, let's say considerable data sets data sets and they have also created vocabularies I will share um, some links also in the chat in, in a minute. Another um, community is also citizen science, I think, where um, there's also a, a high need for integration of data because data is very scattered. And there are also several initiatives um, trying to standardize this. Um, and then of course there's OGC, that, yeah, we all know about that. There, there's this uh, definition serve and the glossary um, I think these are all things uh, that are worthwhile looking at. Uh, currently, from our point of view, uh, as a, a university, we are also looking and actually performing a project now on the modularization of education. Uh, and we also need uh, glossaries for this and links to concepts uh, where uh, concepts we can borrow, for instance, from the body of knowledge. Uh, and link that, tag that to uh, educational content. So that, that is also something that is, uh, let's say, um, yeah, increasingly important for us also to share educational content also with other universities and also to customize our education for um, our new students. I think that that's it for now. Thanks. I, I will paste some links in the chat. Yes, thank, thank you, Rob, uh, for, for your comments. So as understood, uh, you emphasized that visual, visualizations of all the relations are very important here. And also the importance of growing community and their linked data and also to look into this into the future would be very important. So next one I would invite uh, for sharing her views is Aniko uh, Gerencher from Publications Office of the European Union. Please, Aniko. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you also for the invitation uh, to this, this webinar. It was really, really uh, highlighting. And uh, for the other vocabularies that are recommended to be checked, uh, you already mentioned in the ELISA action, Eurovoc and DET, which are indeed uh, maintained or published by, uh, by our team. Uh, so apart from that, uh, I will put also a link to the, to the chat uh, because we have indeed a very large scale of vocabularies that are maintained by EU institutions and published by the publications office, uh, such as authority lists, for example, the list of countries, 
currencies, languages, um, or institutions, uh, or other thesauri taxonomies and ontologies. So Eurovoc and DET are part of them, but it's a, it's a much bigger scale also in the education domain, uh, also in statistical classifications, for example, and a lot of other vocabularies. Um, uh, and then what is to be to be emphasized also as a use case that these are all published as linked open data uh, they are available from a sparkle endpoint um, which is a semantic repository uh, called seller uh, from the publications office uh, so machines can connect to machines and we can exploit also the linked data features like this uh, and another important aspect is that this these are all multilingual data so they are available normally in all EU official languages uh, and with the use of these vocabularies and with the links and alignments published also between the vocabularies which you can really uh, expand also the exploitation of multilingual data uh, so this would be I think an additional use case uh, for the ELISA action as well because a lot of other vocabularies mentioned are indeed multilingual so you can uh, even expand the coverage and uh, for the other initiatives uh, that were partially they were already mentioned that I also wanted to uh, to stress, for example, the EU knowledge graph, the Cohesio project, uh, or indeed the, uh, the rival agency who are doing an amazing work on uh, on the knowledge graphs uh, and i will again put some links to the chat because we are organizing a series of events these are follow-up events of the indoors conference that was organized last year and the next uh, next one is going to be organized next year uh, and in between we have a series of smaller webinars presentations workshops for example and they are tackling indeed knowledge graphs or linked data platforms uh, in EU institutions, but also in member states. So, uh, for example, in member states, we have very good examples from Belgium or from the Netherlands, from the Czech, Re Czech Republic, for example. Uh, so I will post the links to the chat and you can also see the recordings and the presentations uh, of, uh, of these use cases, because these are indeed all relevant uh, to, to shared knowledge on, uh, on the creation and the use of knowledge graphs. I think that was all from my side. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Aniko, uh, for uh, sharing, let's say, your work and your experiencing on managing the semantic assets and the vocabularies and the code lists, and, and also from the point of view of multilinguality, as you mentioned. Uh, so now uh, we are uh, uh, asking, last but not least, uh, our colleague Sven Schade from Joint Research Center uh, to give his views. Please, Sven. Thank you very much, Simon, uh, and thanks for having me in this session. It was really, really interesting to see all the presentations, but also a lot of old friends in the participant list. So really uh, uh, excited to be here this afternoon. Um, and basically, I just want to add to what has been said instead of repeating, uh, because indeed we saw a knowledge graph uh, for ELISA to really give access to existing uh, resources uh, and pieces of information. We saw the example from Oscar, which was more a knowledge graph for uh, moving into interoperability between public authorities in Spain. And what Andre presented was really a way to uh, use geospatial technology in a different way to get access into, into knowledge graphs, which was extremely fascinating uh, as well. Uh, and looking into all of these examples, uh, but also into the evolution of the semantic web in the last 10 to 15 years, I think it's very safe to say that ontologies and knowledge graphs all have their good reason and good purpose to be, uh, but there are also good reasons that there are different knowledge graphs and different ontologies. So I think it's, it's equally so safe to say that for the future, if we now look ahead, uh, most likely we are not looking for a single uh, knowledge graph or a single ontology to capture everything under one umbrella, uh, but uh, it will be equally fine or even better or more realistic that in the future there will be remain <coughs> excuse me a lot of a lot of existing knowledge graphs and they may also contradict each other so what i would really see uh, for for the future and for the next step uh, especially to help knowledge transfer from one community to another is to invest more time uh, into the 
translation of content using different knowledge graphs. So in that sense, on the one hand, using a knowledge graph to expose all the uh, concepts and the material and the vocabulary a community is using, but on the other hand, also invest in the ways to project and translate that knowledge into the knowledge graph and into the vocabulary of another community so that they can understand and learn from, from lessons taken elsewhere. So I think this is one of my, way, uh, my main takeaway actually of today, uh, really looking more into uh, the coexistence of different knowledge graphs for different purposes and also facilitate the translation of, of knowledge between different communities in a formal way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sven, for complementing uh, your views with, with the views of the others' uh, discussions and to give also a bit of the insight of the future outlook. I think we were coming uh, to the end of the, uh, this um, comment section. Uh, one thing is that I think one name has been mentioned today many times, uh, which was Marina Guado from the European Railway Agency. So, uh, Arina, uh, uh, Marina, would you like to add something on this? I think your colleagues mentioned you, your work already. Would you like to emphasize something? Uh, hi, hello. I don't know if you can listen to me. Yeah, no. Hello? Yes. Yes, we can. <laughs> Thank you, Lorena. Uh, well, I yes, uh, I'm really happy to, to watch this seminar and to see that all our activities are so aligned on the topic. I, we start this journey on knowledge graph implementation with uh, two of our registers demonstrating the semantic interoperability between them. It's currently in production and there are a huge amount of trippers, more than a million trippers in the knowledge graph with the railway infrastructure that is provided by the different member states. So we successfully amalgamated the, the two registers of information we, we had in-house. And well, I, I would like to thank you here, from here, our colleagues from the University of Ghent that helped us during this journey and also DIGIT. Uh, so, yes, it's in production, it's challenging and it's open or in growing, uh, in growing phase because currently we are, we are joining other actors to also establish links with other uh, registered and external data stores. So, and I will be happy if you have any question, I will put my contact information in, in the chat. Thank you, thank you very much, Marina, uh, for your intervention as well. It, it was not uh, announced, but I think it was very welcome because of your uh, excellent work you're doing as well. Uh, I've been looking into the chat. I think most of the questions that were put in the chat were already answered, and we are coming uh, quite uh, to the late to the to the till the end of the webinar. So, if there is no one to to comment uh, something uh, else or to add something else. I would um, uh, use this opportunity to invite you to the next ELISA webinar, which will be held on 28th of April at the same time as today, so two o'clock Central European Summertime. So we will be uh, presenting, uh, let's say, uh, a bit an overview of ELISA uh, in the webinar of Achieving Location Interoperability, Lessons Learned in ELISA Action and Future Perspectives. Registration will be available soon. And you will be, of course, uh, also uh, with the materials from the today's webinar invited to, to, to be there with us in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, so before, before the end, I would invite you also to, uh, to follow us at the various channels, as you can see on the next slide. Uh, so you can follow us on Join Up, uh, uh, Elisa Community, Elisa Collection in Join Up. A Twitter account, you have direct email address uh, to post any questions or comments. And uh, last but not least, on the, our Elisa channel, through which uh, YouTube channel, through which we also, uh, let's say, today live stream since uh, the high interest uh, of the webinar. 